All right, let's take a look at this zero day vulnerability. So in October 2020, Google Threat Analysis Group detected an in the wild exploitation chain for iOS, which had a Safari browser code execution exploit, an XNU information disclosure, and an XNU Tyco. So in August 2021, they also found a variant of this vulnerability, which was being exploited in the wild against macOS users and they were visitors of Hong Kong websites for a media outlet and a prominent pro-democracy labor and political group. And this got a new CVE associated with it. So let's talk about that XNU background. So XNU is X is not Unix, and that is the kernel for iOS, iPadOS, macOS, tvOS. And it is a kernel that's based on the mock microkernel originally created at Carnegie Mellon. And a microkernel is specifically a design paradigm where you try to have the stuff that's in the kernel be as small as humanly possible, and then you set it up so that it can send messages to other components that can run outside of the kernel, and they will, you know, subsequently be deprivileged, and that should lead for, to a, you know, safer code execution environment. Now, the reality of the situation is that in X and U, for performance reasons, which Apple clearly states in its own documentation, they don't run most of the components outside of the kernel that could be. But they do keep the mock design interface from the original Carnegie Mellon mock, and the benefit of that is that it allows for a very modular construction, because normally the mock microkernel was expecting to be able to send messages to subcomponents out in user space, but now, even though the subcomponents may be inside kernel space, you can still at least have a well-designed modular interface to talk to them. Now, we need to cover some terminology in order for you to understand the code that you're going to be looking at in this section. In mock, a process is called a task, and there are one or more threads inside of a task. So we've got multiple threads all running in an enclosing task. And the communication between the modular parts is achieved via interprocess communication. So you'll see lots of code with IPC in its name for the various structure types. And that IPC is done to things called ports. So these ports are one-way unidirectional messaging interfaces by which a task can receive information from other tasks. And also the task could be the kernel. And so the kernel could be receiving information via ports uh, from other tasks, which are user space processes. Now we need to drill down a little bit on the types of messages that are sent to those ports. And so the message can have, you know, various data inside of it. But for our purposes here, we only need to focus on the header that's going to be on those messages. So specifically in the header, there is a remote port and a local port. The remote port specifies the destination. So that's where this mock message is going to. And the local port specifies a reply port. So this is basically because ports are unidirectional, if task one sends a message to the destination port that's held by task two, task two wants to be able to reply back to task one with some, you know, acknowledgement, with some data, whatever the nature of the, the message is. If it wants to reply back, because they're unidirectional, it can't just reply back through the existing communication channel. It needs to reply back through a different port that is specified in the mock message header. So that other port is specifically called a reply port. And then we need to talk about special reply ports. So according to one of our cited references, pre-iOS 11, there was a single per task special reply port that could be obtained in user space with the function mock reply port. And what makes the special reply task special is that for performance reasons, that reply port, the place where, you know, you send a message, it's going to come back to that reply port. That reply port could be linked to the destination port inside of its IPC port, kdata, sync inheritor port field. So you'll be looking at the data structures in this section. But basically, this field right here is going to hold a pointer to the destination if a special reply port was used in the sending of a message, if a special reply port was passed as the reply port. Then starting in iOS 11, there are now per thread special reply ports. So pre iOS 11, a single special reply port. Now there's a per thread one that can be gotten with thread get special reply port. And starting in iOS 12, these special reply ports could be linked via this field again to things other than ports. But for our purposes, let's just focus on the idea of special reply ports will be linked to the destination port via this particular field, which we'll come back to again later on. Now, part of the reason why XNU so frequently has type confusion vulnerabilities is because they think of it as being object-oriented and they design it that way. 
It's not object oriented in the sense that, you know, it's all C++ code or something like that. Instead, they talk about the objects that are backing a mock port as being an object. So just to, to read this verbatim, single task may have multiple ports that refer to resources it supports. Again, task is like process. Task can have multiple ports. And for that matter, any given entity can have multiple ports that represent it, each implying different sets of permissible operations. Here, entity probably means object. So any object can have multiple ports that represent it. For example, many objects have a name port and a control port, sometimes called the privileged port. Access to the control port allows the object to be manipulated. Access to the name port simply names the object so that more information can be obtained about it. Now, literally for some, you know, this is just a conceptual thing, but for some ports, there's a much more literal interpretation of this because they actually have a field in the struct called a K object that points at a kernel object of some type. So to borrow some pictures from one of our references, if we think of an IPC port, this is the data structure defining a port. Inside of it, it's got this IO bits field toward the beginning, and this basically says how to interpret this K object field later on. So for instance, if it's just a plain regular port, the IO bits may have this most significant bit set just to say it's active. But if instead it is what's called a user client port, then it'll have this IO bits K object indicating that the type of the port is a port that has a kernel object and what kind of kernel object is specified then by some more of these type bits, these IO bits, which specify the type. So in this particular case, it says IO kernel object type is IO kit connect because a user client is a mechanism in mock for a IO kit driver to allow user space to contact it. So this is a literal interpretation of the mock port is effectively an IO connect uh, object type. You can have other object types as well. So here is a quote unquote voucher port. And the only difference is that it has a different IO kernel object type set in the IO bits. Now there are actually a lot of different types that a kernel object type can take on. And so this is why, you know, this is the thing we're suspicious of when we're looking for type confusion vulnerabilities, some notion that there can be many, many different interpretations for the same data. In this case, there's almost 50 different interpretations for the same K object field. Now what's also important is to know that that K object field is actually part of a union. This is part of the K data union. And so that means these are all pointers. So it's just a pointer component of the struct that is the IPC port. So the pointer here can be interpreted as a K object pointer, a K object label, an importance task, a sync inheritor port. That's the thing we said with special reply ports. So there are many interpretations for this particular pointer field. And it's all down to what this first field, the IPC object, says in its IO bits. So basically, what is this? We don't know until we check the IO bits. So for instance, if the IO bits has a K object, has literally IO bits K object set, then it's the code, the subsequent code should be, you know, checking the bits and then using this thing as a K object. And if the bits is not set, then it shouldn't use it as a K object. It should use it as something else. So what this means for type confusion is that if this is the type detection mechanism, if the IO bits tells you what type this stuff is, then if the attacker can change the IO bits while leaving this pointer the same, that would cause a confusion. Or if they can change what the value here points at while leaving the IO bits the same, then that would also cause type confusion inside of the code. So. Let's return to the special reply ports, and we see that this field that I told you about, the IPC port kdata sync inheritor port, is a member of this union. So that's going to be, you know, part of your hint for what's going on here, where the type confusion can come in. So again, we have many object types, port types, and message types within XNU, and that's why there are many opportunities for Tycho and Mach, and there have been many vulnerabilities of this type. So this particular vulnerability that you're going to go hunt for in the code is a Tyco that is caused by the use of the kdata union for mock ports, a function that can be used to change what the kdata refers to, and missing sanity check code to handle corner cases and sanity checks for what exactly this kdata is referring to. 
All right, so there's a relatively small amount of code in the hint section. So again, this code is going to be on the website. This will be your hint as the most relevant things, but you're going to go download the actual full code so that you can navigate around, find what the definition of things are and so forth. And if you need an extra special bonus hint, then I would just say, go read this code a little bit, you know, cross-reference the hint code and the real code, read it for a little bit, and then come back and watch this video because it has a somewhat leading explanation, you know, upon reflection, once you've seen some of the code, you might see that this video is a little bit leading in terms of uh, trying to give you a hint about where the vulnerability is. All right, so go read the code and find the flaw.